Okay, time to start. Alrighty, let us jump in. We were talking last week about some of the great American prophetic figures, but especially Herman Melville. And uh, I want to continue today in terms of trying to keep alive some of the grand possibilities of alternative vision, alternative analysis, and especially the arts. We want to thank again a two two wonderful artists here who have consecrated this space for us with the movement of their bodies and hearts and minds. And so let's give it up for our two artists here. It's the deal, our dear brother, definitely. I also want to acknowledge where's dear sister Amy and her beloved parents. So there they are, just wave, just wave at us. Give it up for our dear brother. <laughs> we appreciate it, appreciate it. But it's very important because it's a fundamental question. What are the conditions for the possibility of alternative visions, analysis, motion, momentum, and movement in the United States, in the democratic experiment, in the American empire. That when Melville and others talk quite honestly and wrestle quite unflinchingly with various forms of nihilism, and when Eugene O'Neill concludes in The Iceman Cometh, he cannot conceive of the conditions, the possibility of fundamental transformation in the United States, we will always be tinkerers will never want to really call into question some of the basic institutions. We have to raise the question, can we conceive of an American democracy without empire? What would it look like? Can we conceive of an American democracy without male supremacy operating in ugly ways? What would it look like? American democracy without white supremacy, without homophobia, without transphobia, without a demonizing of Muslims, without a targeting of Jews, or Arabs, without forgetting what happened to indigenous peoples in terms of American ex expansionism. Are, are there ways of concretizing answers to these questions? Because if we are unable to even imagine how it can be actualized and realized, then all of the discourse in the world about alternative visions and strategies will remain precisely that, abstract, in the worst pejorative sense, academic. Do we have enough trust in the capacities of our fellow citizens to actually undergo various forms of attention types of cultivation and various means by which maturation can take place. And I want you to highlight those three terms, attention, cultivation, maturation. That's precisely what sits at the center of democratic soul craft as put forward at the highest level by American artists. Now, I know it may sound very oxymoronic to take seriously that last line of Shelley's great pamphlet in defense of poetry, poetry that he published at the end of his life. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. The visionary ones, the empathetic ones, not just the versifiers, the citizens who muster imagination and empathy to conceive of alternatives to the present reality. And is it possible for the artists who are often the vanguards of the species to provide visions that can take on life? Now, Brother Roberto, Professor Unger will be talking very much about the energizing that is required, the galvanizing that is required. And we know that has everything to do with integrity and honesty and courage and fortitude and determination. Now, we, we're entering the, uh, the week of our dear brother Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, 50th anniversary of his assassination, his murder, his execution. Uh, and next week, we hit it even more directly. But Martin King is just one rich, deep voice in a tradition of Americans of different colors. No one group has a monopoly on the truth telling and witness bearing. But he's one particular crucial voice in a tradition that's tried to do very much what this class is about, which is 
dream of those questions, dreaming of an America without structural forms of injustice, <coughs> dreaming of an America in which institutionalized hate like white supremacy couldn't be overcome in the name of a love and a justice. Do any of those dreams have any validity on the ground? For him, in 1968, for us, 50 years later, 2018. I want to begin with that first question, America without empire, because I mean, one of the wonderful uh, uh, dialectical interplays of a certain kind of both creative tension as well as overlap between Professor Unger and myself is I tend to talk about empire over and over and over again. When you look at the US military budget, every dollar 53 cent goes to the military industrial complex. That's empire. 26,000 bombs dropped the last year with Barack Obama, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Five wars going on simultaneously. That's empire. How many Iraqis dead? Almost a million since the invasion under George Bush. Any talk in America about those lives? Hardly at all. That's empire. 4,800 U.S. military bases, 586 in other countries, 120 countries, U.S. special operations. That is empire. And my conservative brothers and sisters come back to me and say, oh, Brother West, your critique of empire is always one in which you never doubt, you never accent the degree to which without the American empire, the Chinese empire would step in. Without the American empire, the Russian empire would step in. That's a serious conversation with conservative brothers and sisters. What would the world look like without the US empire? If in fact, other empires on the move trying to fulfill various voids that would result from the US empire itself being democratized. These are the kinds of very, very concrete issues we need to talk about, but they have everything to do with US democracy. And so oftentimes our discourse about US democracy is so intra-USA and not connected to what at Kennedy School our fellow neoliberals and technocrats and managerial elites would call foreign policy and domestic policy. And of course, in this class, for the most part, you don't get to a discourse about domestic policy unless you come to terms with plutocracy, oligarchy, unless you come to terms with poverty, unless you come to terms with the realities that people have to live with every day, and then come up with some responses, the decrepit schools, the indecent housing, unemployment, underemployment, and that section in the Tocqueville that we've come back to over and over again, why Americans are so restless in the midst of prosperity, that deep melancholia, that sadness that results from the market-driven quest for consumption in which insatiable pleasure never satisfies the soul. That's the Tocqueville, 1835. Does he resonate in 2018? Hell yes. Alexis, how did you see this so long ago? Oh, I know these folk. These are the kinds of peoples who come to a context where they're continually on the move. That rat race is intensifying. The preoccupation with upward mobility is part and parcel of their conception of a dream. And that American dream is a dream usually though not solely, but usually one of a certain material status with a house and a home and a various fence, usually a white fence. We can go on and on and on. And the Tocqueville says, oh, I see. The perennial questions that every human being in every generation has to come to terms with. What kind of human being are you gonna be? What will be the weight 
of integrity, honesty, decency, generosity, and courage in your life. But how will that fit in a dominant terrain in which prosperity, money, status, power forever dangles, making it, as it were, in the language of Norman Podhoritz in his minor classic in the 1960s. Life is fundamentally about making it. Success in that narrow sense. And de Tocqueville raises the same question that this class has been raising. What happens to spiritual and moral greatness translated to a concern about struggle for freedom and justice? And greatness cannot be reduced to gigantic success at that spiritual and moral level. Our artists remind us. That's in part, I'm sure, what the dance was about that we didn't get a chance to see, but the spirit still lingers, you see. That kenosis, that self-giving, and that self-emptying at work in your dance. Because that's what great art is all about. Can you empty and give yourself in such a way that it takes the various kind of form that touches the heart, minds, and souls of others and unsettles us in such a way that we want to be ena enabled and ennobled. We want to be better human beings, not just richer in terms of money, not just more status in terms of spotlight and so on. But is it possible or are dreamers like Melville, who ended profoundly disappointed. Martin King, we'll see a little bit more next week, who said at the end of his life that life is a matter of perpetual shattering of dreams rather than a realization of dreams. And of course, Iceman Cometh was a major word in that four hour performance that Denzel Washington is enacting right now on Broadway. Pipe dream, pipe dream, pipe dream. Never ever to be actualized or realized. And you can imagine critics of this class looking at me and Brother Roberto and saying, oh Lord, we got another two brothers involved in their pipe dream, talking about fundamental transformation talking about trying to think in alternative ways, accenting imaginations, just like your papers or your, or your exams when we read them and we eagerly look forward to reading them. Feel free to be called a pipe dreamer. Stretch out, broaden your horizons, think in alternative ways. And yet at the same time, we have to come back to earth. And I was blessed to be at the, um, the march this weekend. I know some of you, did you all see that on t TV, the March for Life this weekend? It was really quite powerful. I went down with my beloved, beloved daughter. Uh, uh, and uh, it, was, it was very, very moving. 11 years old, 16 years old, 18 years old. Martin Luther King Jr.'s granddaughter was there. You saw her. Oh, what a presence, already charismatic, already love and justice flowing from our heart and soul and mind, you see. So at home with the microphone, you think, no, it's not genetic, that's not osmosis. She's had to practice just like Martin did, but she's in that same legacy. Signs of hope, young folk dealing with life or death, guns out of control. But we know the gun issue is connected to a whole host of other issues, from the political, to the economic, to the psychic, to the spiritual, to the imperial. You see, the United States, what is the dominant myth of the United States? The frontier. What is the frontier? Moral regeneration through violence. The line between civilization and barbarism. Expendent, always expanding the lines of civilization against the barbarians. Who are the barbarians? Indigenous peoples, 
Are they really more barbaric than the expansionists and the imperialists taking their land? Is John Wayne to be believed in dominant American film? Frontier. There's no accident America has the most violent history when it comes to issues of class. We forget that. The railroad strikes of 1872, the Pullman strikes of 1892, the fact that the Pinkertons in Ohio under control, private armies under control of barbarians had a bigger army than the state of Ohio. The workers crushed, they didn't get the right, we talked about this before, didn't get the right to engage in collective bargaining until the 1930s. Repression, massive, Eugene Debs in jail, deportations against the Germans in, night, in World War I, violence, oh my God, slavery, Jim Crow lynching, we won't even go there. We know how violent that was every day, not just those isolated incidents. Domestic violence against women, chronic, systemic, hidden, and concealed. Ugly violence against gays and lesbians, and especially the one group subject to most violence today, our precious trans brothers. Not to quote, can't say brothers and sisters because they go beyond that, that gender binary. I just say precious trans folk. The we's and the they's in one body. God bless them. You see, violence. Film violence, that's part of the irony and hypocrisy of seeing these Hollywood stars so upset about violence on Saturday night and they move right into Monday and make some of the most violent films in the history of the art form for big, 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 big money. Didn't I just see you kill 15 people in your last film? Yes, but I'm actually very much for nonviolence. Oh. Somebody else just wrote the script. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. My career depends on being that kind of person. Oh, I see. Violence in all of its various forms, as American as cherry pie, that's part of what those young folk were talking about. The cumulative effects and consequences, not just of gun laws, but of a whole culture of violence. I don't know how many Canadians we have in the class. Anybody here from Canada? Oh, oh of course, Sister Jill, Professor Jill from Canada. Canada has roughly the same population as California. More Californians kill each other with knives than Canadians kill each other with anything. So if you took away all of the guns in California, you'd still have more folk killing each other with knives in the whole country of Canada. Now, that doesn't mean the gun laws not to be called into question. I'm saying promote gun laws. But something else deeper is going on. You're talking about a culture of violence that we're all socialized into. And there's linguistic forms of violence. We can go on and on and on in that regard, you see. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about frontier myths and the way in which we get inculcated and incorporated in various cultures of violence. And so when we get dreamers who are talking about nonviolence, like Fannie Lou Hamer, or Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, or Martin King and others, how they have to cut so radically against the multi-layered grain in the kind of democratic experiment, in the kind of imperial experiment, in which we find ourselves. Can we think of American democracy without empire and the culture of violence that goes along with it? And then the culture, the, the courage to, to come to terms with the effects. You see, the fact that we can't even see the American soldiers who come home from Afghanistan in other parts of the world, on television, the tears of their families. And there's been thousands of them, thousands of them. The 1960s, we could see it. 
Walter Cron Cronkite would talk about it. Now it's on the down low. Now you got to go to the airports and see the family standing there as the bodies come from the body of the airplanes with all of the family devastated, agonized, wrestling with anguish. It's happening every day in America, hiding and concealing the effects of the bombs dropped, the wars being waged. I don't even talk about the empire at work in that regard. What's going on in Africa right now? Afro.com, Afrocom was tied to U.S. foreign policy. You see, these are the kinds of issues that will have to be wrestled with if we're ever going to talk about alternative visions, analysis, strategies, and most importantly, democratic forms of soul craft. One of the most pernicious aspects of neoliberal soul craft that we've talked about in this class, the cult of smartness, the obsession with riches, and the dropping of bombs as if there's not human beings under those bombs. The larger neoliberal soul craft. And that's one of the reasons why many of us were so critical of our dear brother Barack Obama, because he's so brilliant and he's so smart and he embodies and enacts the height of neoliberal soul craft. How can somebody with that beautiful smile, so bright, coming out of the leading law school in America, Harvard Law, drop 26,000 bombs, 563 drone strikes. And there's old Bush, George Bush, not the smartest brother in the empire. <laughs> Harvard business, not Harvard law. Okay, okay, okay. That's fine. Love you, George. 45 drone strikes. They call him a war criminal, but the neoliberal one, oh no, he's just a wonderful black president who likes to smile. He's very smart, and he has to do things that are very tragic. Where's the consistency? Hiding and concealing underside because of the smartness. Now, we should have learned from Germany in the 1930s that Goebbels, one of the smartest Germans in the country, reading Goethe every other day, listening to Beethoven, obsessed with Schiller and Kant, Nazi to the core. Smartness can adjust to some of the vicious forms of injustice and evil. So to be the smartest person in the room is not just in, 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 insufficient, but it's thoroughly misleading. It's, it's, it's a, a certain kind of idolization of an aspect of a person that goes hand in hand with the hiding and concealing of their character, of what kinds of actions they can engage in, and it becomes a very mode of invasion. So the cult of smartness that is hege hegemonic more and more in the academy needs to be radically called into question in the name of a democratic soul craft. So instead of smartness, we're talking about wisdom. We're talking about courage. Talking about compassion. That's how you foreclose the Goebbels. That's how you foreclose the neoliberal smart folk who hide and conceal their violence. That's what democracy is about. Listening to the voices of the victims of the actions, deeds, and policies of neoliberal smarts or outright raw reactionary, know-nothings. And that's probably a beginning of a description of our dear president, old Brother Trump, the know-nothing face of the empire. Obama, we had the neoliberal smart face of the empire. Different domestic policies, more and more now even different foreign policy in terms of war with, with Bolton now running things, but the chronic consistency of bomb dropping, 
of special operations, of assassinations, sometimes even U.S. citizens, in the case of Obama, you see. Those are the unsettling aspects of coming to terms with democratic soul craft. That's precisely why the Whitmans and Democratic Vista and the Melvilles in Moby Dick were such subversive vis-a-vis -vis the mainstreams of their own day. And that's why Martin King ended up being so radically unpopular at the end of his, his life. And just keep in mind this week when you hear all this talk about Brother Martin over the weekend, because they're having a huge gathering in Memphis. And just watch all of the centrist, moderates, neoliberal folk talk about Martin and look how they're going to domesticate and sanitize and sterilize him. They're not going to talk about his critique of the empire, dreaming of what an American democracy looks like without imperial policies for him beginning with Vietnam, but also concerned about Latin America and other places. He's going to be that American citizen with his allegiance to the flag as if he never engaged in critiques beyond the borders. And that's a challenge to each and every one of us because in the end, if we don't look beyond the borders, what happens outside of the borders deeply affects what the possibilities are inside. And so the connections of inside, outside, very, very important. The same would be true with the others. I won't go into as much detail in terms of what, what would American democracy look like without the domination of Wall Street of, the, of our economy? It's Brother Bernie Sanders' question. What would American empire, uh, democracy look like without a predatory capitalism? Interesting question. Nobody knows the answer. Let's think about it. What would American democracy look like without vicious forms of patriarchy and misogyny and sexism? My God, so different. And what would it look, out, what look like without white supremacy? Ooh, you really got to stretch for that one. It's no accident that Afro-pessimism is becoming more and more popular because the claim is what? America will never, ever, ever overcome its forms of white supremacy. It cuts too deep. It's the fundamental seeds that sprout in the soil of the nation. Why even dream about it? Well, it's a serious claim. We talked about that in relation to Garvey. That's our dear brother Coates' claim. Tanahisi Coates, God bless him. You see? How do we respond? Very important questions, you see, very important questions. But some of us believe that it's not just a matter in any way of trying to determine whether we think with imagination and empathy like the great poets that Shelley was talking about at the end of his pamphlet. Because there have been traditions of folk who have done that against slavery, against Jim Crow, against early ways of patriarchy, against earlier forms of capitalism, against anti-Arab and anti-Jewish and anti-Muslim realities, and it had some impact. We wouldn't all be here in this room together if it didn't have some impact. And yet we're at a moment when counter-revolution is more and more in the driver's seat. Here and in Kenya and Hungary and Poland in India, in Russia, so many other places. So it is a profoundly bleak moment that we attempt to, in some way, maturely dream. Not naively, not adolescently, but maturely dream of a better world and an alternative world. But let me stop here because we want to make sure we've got good time for questions. Yes, my dear sister. And speak up so we all can hear your lovely voice.
Yeah, I appreciate it. Because the first thing for me is it's an existential question, which is what kinds of persons do we want to be before the worms get our body? Because we know that individually or collectively, we're not going to create paradise. So that the question becomes, well, if I define myself over against lies and violence, you know, those wonderful words of uh, Anton Chekhov, the letter that he wrote to the poet Alexis in October of 1888, and he said, my holy of holies, it's not just human body and health and intelligence and talent, and inspiration and love, but it's freedom from lies and violence. And that's the road I'm going to travel regardless of whether I win or not, because that's the kind of person I want to be. I see that's the raw stuff of democratic soulcraft. This is not a matter of utilitarian calculation and consequentialist reflection. If I do X, we can win this. If I do Y, I can win that. No. This is the kind of human being I want to be. This is the kind of witness I want to bear. This is the kind of cost that I'm willing to bear. This is the kind of responsibility I put upon myself. So let's say a student at Harvard. I reject the code of smartness, but I don't want to be stupid. I want to be wise. I am pursuing a quest for wisdom. I will not reduce it to smartness. I won't be seduced by the ideologies of professionalism. I have a vocation before I engage in a quest for a profession. And vocation has to do with the calling of you as a particular human being, regardless of whatever your profession is. You might be a dentist, doctor, lawyer, whatever it is. That's the existential question. That's soul craft in its deepest sense. In its deepest sense, you see. My dear sister Jill was telling me about the new uh, record by John Coltrane and Miles Davis. Yeah. Jazz musicians, jazz man, jazz woman. Did Coltrane play based on what the market said or what his agent said in terms of the money that he made? If that was the case, he'd have been playing my favorite things every night because that's the one that won him the most money. No. He's coming up with all kind of sounds from free jazz to playing with Johnny Hartman, the wonderful ballast of a Coleman, Cole Porter, or Rogers and Hammerstein, and then shifts to interstellar space screaks and shrieks and screams. How come Coltrane is doing all of this? That's what's inside of him. He's trying to be himself, to be true to who he is prior to his expression. He has to be true to who he is. And in, in, and in many ways, the highest level of democratic soul craft is found in the best of black music because it has everything to do with integrity, honesty, decency, courage, the willingness to trust yourself. We saw this in Emerson, right? to trust yourself. But trust yourself means a self that's forever in process, dynamic, changing over time, over against. Emerson's definition of self-reliance is what? Over against conformity, over against the views of others, over against the expectations of the crowd, right? And that's the same true at Harvard or any other place. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. Because which year are you? Yeah, I thought you were one of these wonderful freshmen in this class. Absolutely, absolutely. So you've got three, three wonderful years to work this out here at Harvard. Yeah, now, I know Sister Amy's at the law school. We got some third year folk at the law school, right? They, they've had to work out a whole lot in the past because they're jumping off into professional spaces. It's a very different moment in their lives in that regard, but the same challenge, that same personal existential challenge in that regard. I saw Hannah. Yes, go right ahead. Yes. 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 Like the Greeks had. Like what we could have. A 
like we could have. No, that's, that, that's, a, that's a grand vision, my brother, very much so. Uh, it's very interesting, though, that you know William Buckley, who was our dear uh, conservative, sometimes reactionary brother, used to say that he would rather choose from the first 435 names in the phone book than either the politicians or Harvard professors. He went to Yale, so he had a rivalry, you know. <laughs> but, uh, um, but it's interesting he would say that. Why? Because, you see, the thing is, is that there is a danger, I think, of falling back on the demos without talking about the attention, cultivation, and maturation of the demos. See, Donald Trump's not out there by himself. He's got a social base. He got 61% of my fellow Christians voted for Donald Trump. Now, what if they show up in the direct democracy in the lottery? Two thirds of them happen to be in that lottery. We in bad shape. Why? Because the demos themselves, as precious human beings, like anybody else, must undergo cultivation. They must learn how to shape their attention to the things that matter rather than superficial things. And they've got to undergo maturation. And that's what education's about. That's what education in its end's about. That's what John Dewey talked about when he talked about democracy and education, that classic of his of 1916. Right? It's not just the demos. The demos in and of themselves are very dangerous. It was the demos who were lynching black people in Alabama, Mississippi, and so forth. They're out of control. They need a certain kind of maturation. They need a certain kind of cultivation. They need a certain kind of ways of attending to what really mattered as opposed to the lies that had been taught to them, white supremacist lies. These black people are subhuman, hang them on a tree, 10,000 of them will show up, put up, cut up the body parts, and sell the genitalia. That's sick stuff. That's the demos. That's part of the difference between Chekhov and Tolstoy. Tolstoy had an idealized, romanticized view of the peasants. They had so much virtue. Chekhov said, I am the grandson of a serf, of a slave. I know the peasants. They're wonderfully human, dangerous, and wonderful at the same time. See the difference? The humanizing of the demos and the cultivation of the things required for what it is to have a certain kind of spirituality, morality, empathy, imagination, and so forth. When you talk about the role of imagination, the way Professor Hunger talks about it with such unbelievable wisdom and eloquence, that is a hard work. We can almost say the work, the hard work of imagination. And you as a poet know what I'm talking about. You see, you mean as a poet, you go undergoing all kinds of cultivation, right? And you're reading from Shelley to Gwendolyn Brooks to Wallace Stevens to T.S. Eliot to Ezra Pound to a whole host of other poets. They worked hard too. So it can't just be instantaneous. It's not going to be spontaneous. You've got to work the imagination, work empathy, learn how to unlearn the things that you've been taught that get in the way of your relating to the humanity of others. You see. That's part of what education is also about. I, I should make sure there's some hands on this side uh, up here because I tend to lean to my left too much in more ways than one. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> Go right ahead, my dear sister. Good to see you. Good to see you, my sister. Yes. Yes. almost snuffed out and suffocated some of the other, in other countries, you say? And in, in which particular ones you have in mind? Like Brazil? Brazil, India, uh, China, and 
Yeah, yeah. yeah Ray, Ray. Yeah, do you want to say something about Brazil? Are you going to hold off on that? Uh, you going to hold off on that? Yeah, you're going to hold off on Brazil here. Uh, no, we know of the connections. You know, the, the, the first and only immigrant group that went public in its initial support of Trump were deeply conservative Indian brothers and sisters tied to the Hindu nationalism of the ruler of India. So the connection between Donald Trump on the one hand, Modi on the other, and the supporters of Modi in the diaspora. See what I mean? And, and absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. So I mean, you can see there's connections. In it. Now, whether in fact it has snuffed out, certainly it has suffocated many of the democratic possibilities. Does that mean all possibilities? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, but I tend to proceed on the notion that no matter how mighty the powers that be are, they're never all mighty. That all powers, all kingdoms, all empires, sooner or later undergo change, often decline, and sooner or later fundamental transformation either fall or massive improvement. And so as long as we got that wiggle room, and when you say toxic, toxic seems to be so thoroughly penetrating and saturating that no possibilities can emerge so that the, the neo-fascist one becomes one of eliminating all dissonant voices, all possibilities of organizing, all possibilities of opposing the powers that be. See, I, I don't think that's true in India. India has a number of very powerful voices, not just Dalit voices, but other uh, progressive Brahmin voices and others that are bringing critique to bear. Uh, Brazil certainly is, is a mess. You'd agree with that, though, right? Let me, let me <laughs> mm hmm mm hmm which would have the practical and spiritual resources with which to imagine themselves as different worlds uh, are in fact until now remarkably poor in the creation of alternatives that are appealing to humanity. So uh, outside the rich North Atlantic world, the main alternative that we find in political economic organization is what we sometimes call state capitalism under various labels, sometimes married to authoritarian regimes and sometimes to weak democracies. And each of these great countries remains bent under the yoke of mental colonialism. Uh, so there is then a perverse relation between these two evils. There's the American evil of imagining that the country has already found the definitive formula of a free society and that the rest of humanity must subscribe to this formula or continue to live under poverty and despotism. And then there's the evil of the outside world, of seething and searching, but somehow being neutralized in its potential for the creation of uh, attractive alternatives. Uh, and these two evils then reinforce each other. That's the situation that we're in. And 
uh, mm. uh, somehow our transformative action and imagination have to correct for those evils. That's part mm. of the background mm. to this whole argument that we're having about the United States. The world should instigate the imagination of alternatives, but for the most part, it doesn't. And it's as if, mm. as a result, we had to make up for the deficiencies of the world. Any other last queries before we move to Father Roberto? Yes, my brother. Yes. Yes. So, so what, so what generally happens in the world is that the, the political and economic path that tends to prevail in every society is what you could call the path of least resistance. So there's a set of innovations, for example, technological innovations, like the innovations of the knowledge economy. And then the tendency in these great states is to assimilate these innovations in the form that's least disturbing to the dominant interest and the entrenched preconceptions. Uh, that's what I'm calling the path of least resistance. And, uh, uh, as a result, the larger potential of these innovations, such as the innovations of the knowledge economy, remain, remain suppressed. Now, that then is the opportunity for the opponents of the established order. The opponents of the established order swim against the current, but they have something on their side. What they have on their side is that there is this dormant potential which the path of least resistance has suppressed. Uh, but then there's a problem. And the problem is that to take advantage of this potential through structural change, through institutional innovation, we normally need crisis. Then we say, we want political and economic institutions that diminish the dependence of change on crisis. And the paradox is that the introduction of those institutions may itself depend upon crisis. So what do we want to think? We want to think that somehow the imagination married to transformative action can do the work of crisis without crisis. So that's, that's in a way, the, 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 one of the central problems that is uh, lurking in the background of these arguments that we're having in the courts. You think, for example, of a past crisis, Wall Street collapse 2008-9, you would have thought this was a moment in which there would be a high quality discussion about the financialization of the yes, capitalist economy yes. and the role of the Wall Street elites as opposed to the old corporate elites. See, if American Motors had undergone that same crisis in the 60s when they were in the driver's seat under industrial capitalism, Absolutely. it would have been a very different kind of conversation. Yes, but and that's... Now the financial elites do the same thing. They end up getting a bailout and uh, the homeowners get hardly anything. What is it, yes. 21 billion out of even a, a fund of over 100 billion? So you figure, in that crisis, the counter-revolution wins. Same is true with the death of Martin and the election of Nixon. 
You would think but in that's, 1968 you'd have a conversation about white supremacy. Here comes Nixon with George Wallace's social base. So the counter-revolution <coughs> went no, go right ahead. But that's not just a problem about interests. No. It's also no. problem. It's also a problem about ideas. Absolutely. So, so, Absolutely. so, t- so take that example which you just gave. Now which one I had to of now. the response to the two hundred eight crisis. Okay. okay. The two hundred eight financial crisis. Uh-huh. So the 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 premise of established economics is that if there is a problem in the operation of the financial markets, it must be because there's some localized defect some localized defect in competition or in symmetry of information in the operation of these markets. And there can only be then a localized market defect or a localized defect in the regulatory response to the localized market defect. What that view excludes is what is in fact the case, that different sets of economic institutions can either tighten or loosen the relation of finance to the real economy. That's an example of a problem. Now, why is the problem not perceived? It's not just because it's non-perception accords to the dominant interest. It's because the ideas that are established in the ruling disciplines, in this case economics, inhibit insight into the truth. Uh, and so we see that th- this, is, this is a profound problem in, 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 in that to, to understand the reality and its transformative possibilities, we need structural insight. The high academic disciplines, rather than being part of the solution, are for the most part part of the problem. And each in its own way suppresses structural insight. That's why this discussion that we're having can't be just a discussion in practical politics. It also has to be a discussion in the realm of ideas. And we have to carry the struggle into the internal contests of each academic discipline. Uh, In doing that, we have an advantage, a, a cognitive advantage, which is this internal affinity between insight into the existent and imagination of the possible. So if we have a way of thinking, such as the way now established in these academic disciplines, that suppresses the imagination of transformative possibility, those ideas then deny us any way of understanding what exists. Because it's like we're not understanding, we're just staring at something. Social science becomes a retrospective rationalization of the existent, rather than it, to understand something is to understand what it can become. That's what understanding means in science. And to, we, we understand the phenomenon by understanding what it can become in the adjacent possible, in the next steps. And that's precisely what these dominant ideas deny us. Uh, but, but it's not. It's, it's more than ideas, and it's more. Of than course, it's more than answers. ideas. It's also something called cowardliness. And I give you an example of this: that when Wall Street was bailed out, and it was clear that everyday people were going to have to bear the cost <coughs> of the crimes of Wall Street elites, the market manipulation, insider trading, fraudulent activity, and predatory lending. Everybody knew those were crimes. And not one would go to jail for that, for the most part. There should have been a massive presence of social pressure on the neo-elites in power. When the New York Times put out a story and said that Barack Obama just met with the head of the firms of Wall Street and told them, I stand between you and the pitchforks. I'm here to protect you. I stand with you. You have nothing to worry about. There should have been massive pressure against Obama and company, Larry Summers, our dear Harvard brother, and Tim Geithner, dear brothers from New York, all of them part of that operation. There was a cowardliness in not putting pressure to bear that I gave them a pass. And next thing you know, you get right-wing populism, Tea Party and others come with their critique of Wall Street, and they act as if they are the real bears 
of the critics of Wall Street given their own reactionary well, but, populism. But, so but, that was just a refusal of the progressives to be I courageous know. enough to put pressure to bear. You talked about but, this in your yes, YouTube yes, interview. Yes, but even, even but just to pursue this example, it's sure, important sure. to follow uh, the same yeah, example yes. of the financial crisis. Even the most, even the fiercest critics mm -hmm. of uh, high finance in the United right, States right. Uh, fail to produce in the wake of the crisis of 2008 a project that would change the relation of finance to the real economy. So what did they, what did they offer? They offered the resurrection of the New Deal arrangements, uh, separating proprietary trading from federally deposit, federally guaranteed deposits. Huh? They offered a new technocratic agenda to create the power to liquidate or to uh, uh, turn around a financial organization so-called too big to fail. They offered new standards of capital adequacy. And they offered consumer protection. What they did not offer was any structural project that would even begin to change the relation of finance to the real economy. Uh, and despite all of their ferocity in the opposition to Wall Street. So uh, now, the I'm The things that you have in mind are what? Now, you got, you got Krugman, you got Stieglitz, and others. They were calling for what you call for. That is the progressive wing the of left the liberals. Of the, the left the of the left. Democratic Party. Oh, the Democrats. Yeah, well, taking, taking, oh. taking, oh, no, man. taking oh, the no. greatest sources of opposition to Wall Street, because. Well, I but mean, the Occupy movement was not the left of the Democratic but Party. What did they it was Rick Wolf. Yes. It was those economists that were calling for fundamental concessions of Wall Street, calling for bailing out of working people, and some of them calling for not just national accountability, but the nationalization of certain banks that were violating Glass-Steagall with the, the, the line between commercial and investment banking. Now, there were some voices calling for that. That's, that's why I'm calling for the they. Well, there that's true, Cornell. But, yeah. but, but the choice between the standard regulatory policy and outright nationalization oh, is, is not a real choice because what, what, what's, what's missing in that, the outright nationalization is not going to happen in the United States. So it's, it's, it's like a faint. It's a, it's a fiction. It happened during war, and, and, in wartime. Well, not really. That is, there was, there was a, a coordination of the state Absolutely. with the big business. Absolutely. Government intervening and, in a very heavy Yes, in a, way. in a circumstance of extreme crisis. Yeah, absolutely. So I, it's, it's, it's simply the point that for the situation in the United States to change, mm -hmm. there has to be a project, an alternative programmatic project. This, this project is the reverse side of a majoritarian coalition of workers and producers as against Rontiers, and it has to have an institutional content. Yeah. Uh, and until, until that happens, everything else is going to be very limited, no matter how courageous. So courage is indispensable, Absolutely. but courage has to be guided by ideas, otherwise it's blind. But you don't need a full-fledged project to get significant concessions of greedy Wall Street elites who are embezzling yes. billions but of dollars. You need dollars. a direction. You need a direction. You need a direction? Yes. And you need, yeah, and you need a direction. You need the subject that I want to speak about next, well, which, we, is, yeah, we, which we, is the energizer, time, yeah. which is the energizer. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. We, have, we have in the course <coughs> um, cast aside the linear plan that's laid out in the syllabus. In which we long gone, long gone, long gone. It's like the dance, it's like the dance that we yes, saw. Yes. Linearity, push it out. We want simultaneity. The, the plan in the syllabus is there's a historical discussion in the early part of the course yes. and a programmatic discussion at the end of the course. We haven't done it that way. We've gone back and forth in a spiral-like movement, and in that spirit, then, uh, what I want to do now in this, in these comments of mine, is yet another take uh, in two parts. First, on the historical interpretation of the American experience, uh, and then on the character of the programmatic response. 
before we address in greater detail some of the elements of that programmatic response in the remaining weeks of the course. So first on the historical experience. Um, think of the United States in the period between independence and the Civil War, the period in which Tocqueville's account mm -hmm. of the United States was produced. It was a, a society in which alongside the vast incubus of African slavery, among the free white population, and specifically the free white men, there, there was an absolute predominance of independent, small-scale economic agents. As I mentioned in an earlier class, when Tocqueville visited the United States, only one in every five white men worked for another white man. Now, that's an extraordinary fact, because it means that you had basically, mm -hmm. in the free white population, uh, a society of these small-scale, independent proprietors and agents. Mm -hmm. uh, that society was characterized by an experimentalist uh, spirit. This is a country of tinkers. And tinkers about everything, not just about practical things, but about spiritual things as well. I mentioned the other day to Cornell a remark mm. of that characteristically American figure, William James, <laughs> who was consulted by a lady in Boston society about whether she should take up religion. And William James gave the characteristically American answer, try it out and see if you like it. So that was what the Americans were like uh, in this society of small-scale proprietors. And then comes this other aspect that's intimately related to those two, and which leads me to diverge from mm. Tocqueville's mm. interpretation of the United States. <coughs> the central ideal was not an ideal of equality. Equality was a structural feature of this situation, equality among the free whites. The central ideal was an ideal of, of, of the greatness of the ordinary, that this small-scale proprietor was as great as the king. And, and could stand on his own feet and shape his own life. That was the central ideal. Now, then what we have in the second half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century is these vast powers of economic concentration, industrial mass production, accumulation of wealth, uh, the formation of vast corporations, uh, radically changing that structural Absolutely. situation Absolutely. of the early 19th century. And the American progressives, the progressives of the early 20th century and the first Roosevelt, and then the progressivism of the, sec of the middle of the 20th century, the second Roosevelt, fundamentally accepted this transformation of American society and proposed to tame it, to contain it, by the strong countervailing power of the central government. So this seems to me to be the key to an understanding of the American experience. That that early formula of American society was never completely destroyed as a form of consciousness and as the source of ideals. And that was then overlaid by this wave of historical transformation, which found in strong regulation by the central government an inadequate antidote. Because what that response did not do was to reorganize the market economy and reorganize the democracy, to change the situation in a more fundamental way. That is, to try and restore the original American idea or experience 
and to adapt it to the, to the new economic and political conditions. It didn't do that. It simply tried to contain this force of economic accumulation. Now, that, that then is uh, the beginning of, uh, of an explanation of, of the American experience. So if you, if you go back to that list of 11 features that I cited of exceptionalism in the small sense rather than in a big sense, almost all of them, almost all of the 11 features associated uh, on that list have to do with this historical experience that I just described. The combination of the early 19th century with the subsequent transformations and the insufficiency of the response to those transformations. Mm. Uh, now we have a, a change in the, in the character of economic life with features such as the knowledge economy that might make it possible to breathe new life and new meaning into that early 19th century idea. Because it's no, the, the, the key to economic life is no longer necessarily the aggregation of large resources and stable labor force in large productive units under the aegis of large corporations. It doesn't have to be that way by economic necessity. So the, the, the idea of a society based on radical decentralization of initiative could be reinvented in the new circumstances but not by the means used by the progressives in the 20th century, not just by regulation of corporate power. It would have to be by innovation in the arrangements that organize the market and the state. <coughs> now, let me then complete that suggestion about how to interpret the American experience. Um, First, with a reference to certain other societies. So take the societies of late British settlement, like uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. They were also societies that had this idea of radical decentralization of initiative, dominance by the small proprietors. And they, too, underwent this transformation of the late 19th and 20th centuries for economic aggregation or accumulation, but in a lesser degree. And the same could be said, by the way, of South Africa under the Dutch, under the Boers, that slavery, oppression, as in the United States, mm -hmm. but in the white population, an ideal of the creation of a society dominated by small-scale proprietors. So in this sense, there are partial analogies to the American experience. Without such a radical transformation from the first step to the second step. Now then, what is the form of consciousness that arises in this, in this life? The, the, what we have called in the course the American ideals were decisively shaped by that first stage. That stage in which almost everyone worked for himself. So the, the central ideal is this ideal of self-construction. The individual makes himself. He raises himself up. He becomes more human. He becomes more human by becoming more godlike, kingly. Uh, but under two tremendous taints that we have discussed in the course. So the first taint is a disturbance in the imagination of the relation between self-construction and solidarity. So solidarity is treated as if it were a matter of obligation to the others, rather than as internal to the process of self-construction. No one really saves himself. We're saved by connection. Mm -hmm. And the second disturbance is the taint of institutional idolatry, the false idea that the Americans assimilated in the early 19th century and that they never later abandoned 
that the country discovered the definitive formula of a free society. That the United States is, for all of humanity, the image of what a free society is. And this formula has only to be adjusted marginally from time to time under the pressure of crisis and changing circumstance. So therefore, the suppression of experimentalism <coughs> with respect to the institutions. The Americans are tinkers, but they don't tinker about their institutions. They accord to their institutions an exemption from the reach of the experimentalist impulse. And that exemption is now fatal if the aim then is to reestablish that early 19th century ideal, to reinvent it, to reinterpret it in the new circumstance. Well, that's what I wanted to say in the part of my remarks about the historical experience of the United States. And now I want to make a second set of remarks about the programmatic direction. And up to now, in my interventions in the course, the way in which I have approached this task is by outlining certain features of a project mm -hmm. and th on three main axes, the reorganization of the economy, the reorganization of education, and the reorganization of democratic politics. And I have described this project as a direction and then as a series of initial steps. Mm -hmm. But I want now to try another approach that's not entirely different from this approach, but not the same either. And the emphasis in this approach is to say, our task is not to develop a blueprint, uh, a project with a defined institutional uh, content. The task is to ask, what are the institutional conditions that could energize the American people. The people as a whole, not just some elite within the people. And then this popular energy, mm -hmm. if, uh, if, if educated, if cultivated, if mm -hmm. organized mm -hmm. in the way you described in, mm -hmm. in your remarks, mm -hmm. this popular energy would then produce the result. So rather than having uh, a plan for the institutional reorganization of the country, like the plans that I have been defending in the course up to now, we would have a plan to energize the people. Mm -hmm. And it's the energizing that would produce the alternatives. Now, you'll see, as I describe the institutional conditions of the energizing, that they're not entirely different from what I earlier described as a plan. But the focus is somewhat different. The emphasis shifts. So first, there's an economic energizing. So what, what's the fundamental problem? There's an entrepreneurial spirit all over the United States, uh, practical ingenuity, and risk-taking widely diffused in the population. But for the most part, it's, it's it's stuck, it's arrested in retrograde forms of business, like traditional, isolated, archaic family business, in which a large part of the population works, or the declining mass production industries. And the revolutionary part of the economy, the knowledge-intensive vanguard, is then an exclusive fringe that locks out the vast majority of firms and workers. So uh, energizing has to mean the development of a series of policies and institutional innovations that open the gateways of access to the revolutionary vanguard. And in this way, fertilize the entrepreneurial spirit widely diffused in the population. And, uh, those, those were some of the economic alternatives that we discussed before. So it's not just policies designed to broaden access to capital, technology, practice knowledge. It's also the reshaping of the relation of finance to the real economy and the rescue of an increasing part of the uh, labor force from conditions of precarious employment. 
because precarious employment producing fear and economic incapacity is inconsistent with this economic energizing. Now then comes the educational energizing. So the educational energizing means a form of education that uh, empowers, that rejects uh, the dogmatic encyclopedia in favor of capabilities, of capabilities of the mind. <coughs> and in the American context, this educational energizing would require us to attack head-on the, the educational dualism that exists in the United States, the division between two very different school systems, and then n not simply to extend the top tier as it now exists to the bottom tier, but to change the character of the top tier. So that was my reference to Dewey's program before. Mm -hmm. So it's not just uh, talking problems through analytically in, in teams, which is the method of the American professional and business class. It's developing a form of education that is dialectical, that resists, that approaches every subject from contrasting points of view. Then there is the, the social energizing, the accumulation of social capital, denser networks of association in civil society outside the state. Only an organized society can generate alternatives and act on them. A disorganized society is disempowered. So then a series of initiatives designed to mm. accumulate this social power, the cooperative character of education, the involvement of civil society outside the state acting through cooperatives in partnership with the state in the provision of public services, and the development of forms of voluntary or mandatory social service in the United States, a whole range of forms designed to hasten the accumulation of social capital, which is what I'm calling this social energizing. Then there's the political energizing, the fourth realm of energizing, the economic, the educational, the social, uh, and now the political. So what we want is a higher level of popular engagement in political life. But the arrangements governing the relation between money and politics, or politics and media, are hard to change in the United mm -hmm. States mm -hmm. in the first step. So we might begin with a re-energizing and reinvention of federalism, that is, action down below in the states and the municipalities. And then the fifth axis is governmental energizing, because all these other forms of energizing require a capable state. And the fundamental practical obstacle is that in the United States, the aggregate tax take compared to the tax take in all the other rich North Atlantic democracies is too low at least 10% of GDP lower than it is in all the other rich industrial democracies. And uh, the American state starved of fiscal resources cannot be the ally of these different forms of energizing. So the only way to make feasible a significant increase in the tax take in the short term is to rely very heavily on an indirect and regressive form of taxation, as the Europeans do. And so the, the progressives would have to give up their opposition to regressive taxation, and the conservatives their opposition to any increase of the aggregate tax take. Uh, and that would be a pact in favor of this raising of the level of energy. <coughs> now. 
there might be a sixth form of energizing, which is much less accessible, but which was vital in earlier moments in American history, and that's the religious energizing, mm -hmm. as in the great awakenings of the early 19th century. And uh, much, less, much less amenable to deliberate action, because then it depends on the formation of religious and spiritual movements in the country that refuse to privatize religion, that speak publicly in a religious voice. Now, the, the, the suggestion that I'm making is that viewed in this way, the problem of transformation is not a simple right-left problem. Because many of these forms of energizing that I've described are capable of being ex accepted or desired by forces in the United States that would not consider themselves leftist or even progressive. And then what they would represent would be a wager, a bet, on this cause of popular energy. Now then comes the standard objection of classical liberalism which was that, that, that the energizing of the people is dangerous because they're energizing mm -hmm. and we don't know to what end. But in that respect, we have to make a crucial distinction between two forms of energizing. Mm -hmm. And you already mm -hmm. adumbrated mm -hmm. this distinction in your remarks in the first half of the class. So one thing is mm -hmm. the popular energizing that takes place under the aegis of Caesarism. So there's a leader and an atomized population. The population is neither educated nor formed nor organized, but manipulated by this leader that then projects the popular frustrations. But the alternative form is the idea of a, of a, a, a dynamic of energizing that is educated that is formed, that is organized. Uh, and it does not have a predefined goal, but we have reason to trust it if we are Democrats and experimentalists. So it is not without its risks, but neither is it a leap in the dark. And, and that then is, is the, the alternative conception. So the energized people energize not in some vague, indistinct way, but by the specific mechanisms that I described are then the practical expression of this ideal of the divinization of ordinary humanity. That's how we give practical significance to this idea that, that the ordinary is raised up. So in a way, Cornell, I see this as complementary yeah. to what you yeah. were suggesting yeah. earlier in today's class. Yeah. But in the first example that you gave when you said the uneducated, I think you would have to add the uneducated and the educated in a certain way. Because fascism animates educated people. White supremacy animates educated, white male supremacy animates educated people. Anti-Jewish ideology edu <coughs> animates educated people as well as uneducated. So that you really got both going. You know, Martin Heidegger was a genius. He was a thug as a Nazi. Right? We can go on and on and on. Ezra Pound, one of our greatest poets, was a thug as a fascist. So we got to keep track of both sides. So that in that sense, I'm just giving these brief examples, right? They're just educated and educated together. Because I'm thinking, for example, in terms of speaking directly to the Harvard situation at this moment in Imperial America as it undergoes decline and decay, not just in White House, but across our institutions. What kind of animation can intervene among the highly educated, middly educated, <coughs> less educated, and then some of our relatively uneducated fellow citizens? It's got to be across the board, right? Seems to me. Now, you would accept that yes, recommendation? Yes, yes. Questions? Yes. Oh, oh but it, we, we're going to try to get different voices, my dear sister, freshman sister. Yeah, but, but if nobody has, has we're going to come right back. Is that fair? Is that all right? Just in case we got other voices. Yes, go right ahead. Mm. 
Well, let me see if I understand. So it's a constitutional proposal that rather than having a unified government, you would have, as it were, different administrations for these different themes? Yes, because I think, I think a, a, a disadvantage of that idea is that it, it seems to undermine the, the basis for, for the, the unity of a project. That is, we, we shouldn't think of these different components of the alternatives as if they were just technical issues, right? This is, for example, one of, one of the ways of misrepresenting politics in the United States. You think of it as a heap of issues for which there are technical solutions. Uh, all the practical solutions are flawed, fallible, partial equivalents for one another. What matters is the direction. And uh, the value of a unified government is that it is then the political instrument for the promotion of a cohesive direction. Uh, it's not just a decentralized management of technical issues. So, but your comment had another aspect, which was what I understood to be an objection to the dictatorial or Caesarist character of the presidential regime itself. Was that correct? Is that, was that part of what you said? Yes, because, because what, happens, what happens in societies in which the, the parties are indistinct, as they are in the United States or in Brazil, and not on the whole trusted by the people, is that if you prematurely establish a parliamentary regime, you risk concentrating power in the syndicate of professional politicians. So the, the advantage of the presidential regime is that it allows for a direct march on the center of power in a very large and divided country. That's the advantage. The disadvantage of the presidential regime, as it was designed by Madison through his scheme of checks and balances, is that it is a formula for the slowing down of politics. It deliberately perpetuates impasse. So you might prefer to correct that problem by maintaining the direct election of a president with a strong popular mandate, but creating constitutional mechanisms for the rapid resolution of impasse. Uh, but all of these constitutional alternatives are circumstantial. It depends on the historical moment and on the circumstance. They have no universal value to my mind. Mm -hmm. And one of the differences between the Canadians, Australians, New Zealand, and even South African is they remain sites of the British Empire, even as they underwent various forms of redefining their relation to that empire. That's why the Queen's still on their money, you see. Whereas U.S., we got a very different relation to the British Empire after 1789. So the unleashing of different kinds of entrepreneurial forms of individualism, rugged, ragged individualism, transgressive, frontier myths, very, very different in an anti-colonial, revolutionary attitude toward the British Empire vis-a-vis -vis Canadians, Australians, New Zealand and South Africans up until the, up until the early part of the 20th century. But question. Do 
want to start? No. Where are you start? I mean, it had something to do with what we were talking about a few weeks ago about the difficulty of class politics, class organization, and, and class consciousness. So that when you start talking about uh, taking advantage of a moment in which the greed of corporate elites become highly visible, you see, as long as you're not, if, if you're not focusing on how capitalism operates at this particular moment, if you're not focusing on how workers are being pushed to the margins, then you're not going to be able to generate any kind of politics based on such an analysis. And in this country, where race plays such a crucial role, where gender plays such a crucial role, and rightly so, but race and gender can easily become used and deployed in such a way that it hides and conceals the class dynamics. So all you need to do is get women visible in high places. That's corporate feminism. That's Sister Hillary. Brilliant, sharp, Wellesley, Yale Law, fighting patriarchy. I'm with you, Hillary, fighting patriarchy. I'm not a corporate feminist. Or Obama, again, I don't want to keep coming back to Barack. People think I've got a fixation on that brother. He just, he's just like anybody else, but he's a grand example. He becomes a successful black person at the top, so all of a sudden class dynamics disappear as he reinforces policies that crush poor people and vulnerable people vis-a-vis -vis Wall Street. So that what happens is these issues become so highly visible that we lose sight of the realities of suffering human beings, of no matter what color they are, no matter what gender they are, no matter what sexual orientation and so on. So that's one of the things. But the second problem is, is that you don't have enough folk who are willing to pay a cost in pointing this out. So you end up with either a courageous group of folk like Occupy that responded in a progressive way to Wall Street greed. And what happened to Occupy? We forget. It was massive repression. There were phone calls from White House, Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, LA. These are Democrats. We've got to repress this movement. They're embarrassing us. They're making it look like we are the ones who are doing this as neoliberals and so forth and so on. So the repression, I've come back to this point over and over again in this class. Now when Brother Roberto talks about the ways in which between 1877, let's say the railroad strike, and 1914, the guns of August in World War I, one of the reasons why transformative alternative views were not highly visible was because the workers' movement and populist movements were defeated. They were repressed. Their leaders were thrown in jail and so forth and so on. Repressive apparatus of the U.S. nation state is very real. That's connection to Martin next week. But, so there's two going on at the same time. You see what I mean? You've got these two different levels going on at the same. Now, even those two don't fully account for an, an adequate answer to your question, because you know your question generates a seminar. So, so a in whole this, lot of time, different a lot of factors to come to terms with. But those are two crucial ones. Go right so, ahead. so, so, in this remark, yes, yes. there, there, there are there are two distinct uh, contrasts implicit. So, first is the contrast between identity politics and class politics. But there's another contrast, which is the contrast between any politics that is simply a vying for position within the established structure and a politics that involves some effort to change an aspect of that structure. These are two different distinctions. They're related in the following way, that it's much harder for class politics to avoid confrontation with the structure than for identity politics to avoid it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, but it's not impossible to conduct a class politics that avoids contrast with the structure. So for example, the, def the, the, the rear guard defense of the interests of the organized industrial white working class in the Midwest, in the so-called Rust Belt, in the form of safeguards against plant closings or subsidies for declining industries is not necessarily transformative of the structure. 
It's a class politics, but it's not a politics of structural innovation. So, so it's very important to keep those two distinctions separate. And the second contrast is more fundamental than the first one. But it's, then, then, then we come to the substance of what would be necessary in the United States uh, as a social alliance to be the base of an alternative like this alternative that we've been discussing in the course. So there are four groups that are involved. And all of them would be crucial members of such a coalition. So first, there are the, is the, the organized residual working class, headquartered in the capital intensive but declining sectors of the economy, especially of industry, declining mass production. That's about 7%. Yeah. And, that, and now it's a shrinking Very part small. of the population. So but according, according to official leftist doctrine, it's the bearer of the universal interests of humanity. In reality, it comes increasingly to be seen and ultimately to see itself as just one more special interest, as a lobby and a lobby that's now being defended in these reactionary ways by simply avoiding economic transformation. So uh, it, uh, their cause would have to be reinterpreted. Mm -hmm. And you would, would have to say, this economic form of theirs, these declining mass production industries, have no future. They have to be converted into something else, into the inclusive form of the knowledge economy. Then there's the racially stigmatized underclass, caught in precarious employment. For them, we need a new legal regime, a regime that rescues them from precarious employment, be, that mm. organizes them, that represents them, that affirms legal principles such as the principle of price neutrality between temporary and permanent employment. Then third, there's the small business class. The small business class is a vital political agent. There are, more, there are more people involved in the small business sector of the American economy than there are industrial proletarians in the United States. And if we define the criterion subjectively rather than objectively, that is, the petty bourgeois horizon, the aspiration to a modicum of independence and prosperity, that's the majority of the American population. So their political option is of fatal, fateful significance. Huh? And then the fourth group are the restless, ambitious, young professionals and technicians who could opt for anything because they want power and wealth, but they also want fun. They want adventure. And, and so they are, they are potential allies in such a coalition. So the, if, if we look at them in their historical genealogy, they seem to be entirely separate groups with different identities, with different interests, with different sensibilities. But nevertheless, they have a potential of convergence. And the convergence has to be created by a project. So that's what every powerful transformative project in the world does. It creates its own constituency. It doesn't find its constituency ready-made. It finds groups that have accidental external affinities, and then it gradually produces a convergence around a different direction. And, and this would be a profound transformation. But going back to your original point, the single-minded focus on identity politics in the sensibility of the contemporary progressives is a dangerous diversion from this task. Other questions, queries? I think we've talked before in this class about the fact that roughly one out of three of our fellow citizens ever even go to college. So you don't want to live in a silo and think everybody, for the most part, is matriculating through college. No, the vast majority of our fellow citizens never fully matriculate. And that's very important in terms of what it is to be sensitive to the different life experiences and worlds that they inhabit. Well, we've got a question. Yes, sir. 
A little louder, please. Yes. So, so that's, that's this question, right? That this, this is what the Marxists call petty commodity production. You have a society in which there's, there, there's little aggregation of scale, widespread decentralization. Uh, the frontier reinforced mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. yeah, ev even more. And the whole consciousness and self-understanding of the society developed in that background. Then it's overwhelmed by these forces of industrialization, concentration, organization, regulation. But its self-understanding from the early 19th century never completely changed. So that then, then we come today and, and, and we ask, how can this archaic idea be reconciled with the imperatives of radical innovation on a large scale? It's, it's no longer the situation of Fordist mass production of the late 19th century, of the early 20th century. There's no longer this imperative of aggregation of people and resources in large factories and bureaucracies. We could organize something in a different way, but it couldn't be the return to the early 19th century. It couldn't be in the form of these isolated, separate entities. So there would have to be a way of organizing decentralization that is compatible with the aggregation of resources on a large scale. And that then leads us in a direction completely different from the direction of the 20th century progressives to institutional innovations in the organization of the market economy and of democratic politics, as in, as in, as in federalism. That's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. huh? And, and mm -hmm. it, it's, it's that idea that then can be informed and must be informed by a historical interpretation of the country. What is the country? What is its reality? How did it come to understand itself in a certain way? Yes. Wait, 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 wait just one quick thing. I think you've spoken already, too, so we can go back again yes. in, if no one else wants to speak. But just two important names to keep in mind. Thorsten Veblen, V-E-B-L-E-N who was obsessed, preoccupied with the entrepreneurial possibilities of America cast in a progressive way that has an echo in part in what <coughs> Brother Roberto's talking about. And the same is true with one of the great sociologists of the left named C. Wright Mills, who was also concerned about a fusion of the entrepreneurial and for him very much trade union and anti-imperial voices to come together. So when you read C. Van C. Wright Mills, you read Thoris and Veblen, you actually get progressive voices trying to understand the distinctive character of American history in which the role of small business persons can be cast in a progressive way. Because small business men and women are human beings like anybody else, which means what? They're dangerous and wonderful at the same time. They can go one direction and small business can be very, very xenophobic and a whole host of other things, but it can also be very progressive. And Veblen and, and, and Wright were wrestling with this. And you can hear this in Brother Roberto's talk about the entrepreneurials in a particular role. Now we got two quick, oh, oh this, Deborah, you haven't spoken to her, have you? Okay, uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, please, because we, you know we can be wrong. Sure. Yes. Right. And some dialogue a little bit. Yeah. That's right. Mm, 
no, we appreciate that question. Now, it's true for undergrads. Where's Brother Peter? Your brother, Peter, you want to say a quick word about your sections? Just for undergrads, though. Yeah, we try to have uh, some conversational yes. sections. I'm, I'm also going to, even in the biography of Brigham Young, there's a lot of rising star while taking very, a version of this class. The exact same point was raised, was it not, Professor Abraham? It was raised by someone else, who's I also know. now a famous law professor. Yes. <laughs> Another one. Okay, well, what was the <laughs> you mean the point raised by our dear brother right yes. here? About the experimental, democratic experimental character of the class itself? Oh, the class, well, in our sections, we really try to make but you're, Yeah. So you get some countervailing democratic energies. But that's for undergrad only. Yeah. Is that true? No. No, uh, no. You're a graduate student now. Oh, yes, 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 yes. No, well, you make a good point, though, brother. You make a good point. Which means we want to hear your voice and others even a bit more. Because all we have is the call and response. All we have is a conversation, a critical exchange that has some kind of democratic possibilities. But you're absolutely right that the structure of the course within the few weeks that we have, given the richness of the material, make it difficult for us just to come in and open it up and have a conversation across the board rather than allow us to run our mouths for about 35, 40 minutes and then open it up for some conversation going back and forth, back and forth. But did you want to, you want to come back and re reflect on this reflection? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's not clear, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's not clear what we can do in this kind of format. But one, one assumption that I have, it's an empirical assumption, which uh, can, can easily be criticized and challenged, is that in this situation that we're in, we all suffer from a kind of programmatic aphasia. As there's, there's no clear vision of, of alternatives. We don't know how to speak or to think programmatically. And uh, this experience of disorientation, of poverty of the imagination of all terms, is itself disempowering. So one of the things that we can do is we can try and exemplify a desperate attempt to escape from the gravitational field of these dominant ideas huh? in the hope mm. that mm. this will incite some contrary movement by, by you, that as, as in the... A, as in the writing assignment that we gave, right? There's, there's, it's, it's not good enough for us simply to open a discussion that is unprovoked in a circumstance in which the general experience is an experience of impotence, not just of political impotence, but of, but of intellectual impotence, in this confusion about how to think. The, the, mm. the attempt to think programmatically has to be exemplified. There have to be examples of it, because unless there are examples, there's no fire. And then the hope is that one fire will kindle another fire. So that's how I think. So I don't think, and I'll, I'll say directly, I don't think that having a forceful presentation is somehow anti-experimentalist or anti-democratic. I, I think it's the contrary. It's an enabling condition for something to happen. Because otherwise, by pure induction, by spontaneous conversation, uninspired by some provocation of this kind, what's likely to happen is nothing. Uh, and, that's, and that's the ordinary experience in the world. So uh, we can have different views about this, but it is a considered position. In other words, I'm, I'm not doing this just by accident. I'm, we're, I'm trying to seize as forcefully as I can on the material and to give a tangible example of a response to this circumstance of disorientation. We're out of Wonderful. time. One last, last, last question. We've got about 30 seconds. Go right ahead. Less than 30. Dr. Yes. Yes.
Well, one is that we should never limit ourselves to making the measurable the valuable. It's like Baudelaire's definition of a materialist. Fanatic for utensils, enemies of perfume. There are immeasurable things that are highly valuable, like Amy's love of her mother and father. Sister Amy, can we measure the love of your mother and father? That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and that's the beginnings of what it is to be human, to recognize there's a practical wisdom that allows you to understand certain things are measurable and you pursue it. There's other things that are not measurable, that are highly valuable, and you speak with power the way Sister a as Amy just spoke. Heartfelt, there's a whole host of things that are never reducible to measure. There's other things that are, and it takes practical wisdom to know the difference. And we know as religious persons, you and I, religious folk have no monopoly whatsoever on wisdom. Now our text might talk about it, but our praxis is a whole different thing. If I, if I could say, Cornell, yes, yes, in, yes. In um, alongside cleverness and, uh, and wisdom, there's a third thing which would be the most natural thing in the university, and that is insight, imaginative insight. So people mm. are rewarded mm. in their academic careers for being clever. And then when they're very clever, they're good manipulators of symbols, they think they're entitled to have ideas. But there's almost no relation <laughs> between being very clever and ha having ideas. There's no relation. So this, 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 this is, made clear in this contrast that Schopenhauer makes in the world is will and representation between talent and genius. He says, a talented person is a marksman who hits a, a, a target that others cannot hit. A genius is a marksman who hits a target that others cannot see. Genius, and more generally insight, is not about uh, some kind of power. It's, it's a form of vision. And there's no relation between one and the other. And so this, this, is, this is actually what should be central to, to our effort to, to educate ourselves. Uh, cleverness is useful, but it's a very low thing. And it, 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 ha it has very little use for the, for the higher purpose of the intellect. We now really uh, are out really of time. Good. Yeah, but have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful week. Indeed, indeed. Good stuff, brother.